Good afternoon. Thank you for being here to listen to this panel on science diplomacy. The panelists who are joining me today need no introduction, but I'm not sure that my name, my name is there on the board on the bottom. My name is Corinne Wood Donnelly, and I'm an Associate Professor of International Relations in the High North at Norwich University. And for the last several years, I have been looking at questions of science diplomacy, and I thought it was an important message to bring to the Arctic Circle Assembly this year. And so I'm very happy to be joined by our panelists. Many of you know that science diplomacy has a long history in international Arctic cooperation, in particular in facilitating many of the governance arrangements that we see today in the region. At the end of the 1980s, it was questions around a lack of scientific knowledge for the Arctic region and the potential consequences of this knowledge gap that gave reason for Cold War opponents to see beyond the tensions that existed in their relationships to agree to foster collaboration around the environment and to reframe the region as a zone of peace. Science diplomacy has been a core medium of the web of Arctic governance for at least 30 years. But science diplomacy can be one of these terms that isn't, does not have a common understanding among people. And so I want to give you a simple breakdown of what science diplomacy can be defined as and what it can look like in its various forms. As a concept, science diplomacy is normally found, uh, framed around three main pillars. These are science in diplomacy, diplomacy for science, and science for diplomacy. Now, I know these all sound very familiar and just moving around a couple of changing the prepositions or the word order, so I'm going to give you some examples of what this can look like. Science in diplomacy is scientists advising towards di achieving diplomatic objectives, such as using science to inform policy science objectives and foreign policy objectives. We have diplomacy for science, which is dis diplomats facilitating international scientific collaboration. And this can include crafting MOUs, international agreements, to enable cross-border collaboration, resource information sharing, and international research stations. And we have science for diplomacy, which is science fostering diplomacy by improving international relations through shared challenges, such as engaging in joint scientific projects that can build trust and strengthen ties. For three decades, science diplomacy and many of its forms have been a cornerstone of diplomacy, governance, and international cooperation in the Arctic. However, as we all know, given the current geopolitical context, there are signs that even science diplomacy is not enough to hold the Arctic together. Some of these signs include the removal of Russian scientific stations from the Interact network. It includes changes of Arctic Council patterns of cooperation. And it includes the ongoing environmental challenges, many from climate change, that are not being effectively addressed for the region. So today I've asked our panelists to speak to some of these issues that we're facing in science diplomacy and the challenges facing the Arctic region today that can be addressed through bringing together science for and into diplomacy for the Arctic. So I would like to start with Mark at the other end to say a few words about the challenges that we are facing today. Well, thank you, Corinne. Um, first thing I'd like to say is that science diplomacy is not new. It's been recategorized and probably prioritized. But I'll start with the first international polar year in 1882, the fall where observational stations integrated international organizations worked together, countries worked together to put in an observational network into the Arctic, particularly on meteorological issues, but also on some interdisciplinary science issues. Followed in 1932, where over 40 research stations were established, international stations were established within the Arctic. Followed by the International Geophysical Year in 1957 to 59, where they, which resulted in the Antarctic Treaty, and huge advancement of knowledge, huge advancement of space science. Um, and then followed by the, the last one in 20, uh, 2007, 2009, where over 50,000 scientists internationally were involved and uh, many of the current international organizations for science were, were involved in helping to form that. I was deeply involved with that with the U.S. Geological Survey and said it was a remarkable experience. So we've had many, many successful years and that science has lasted and really helped informing relationships, informing international partnerships, 
in management of data. And then the Arctic Council's um, the scientific uh, task force that w was a major success, I think. And I was fortunate to be a member of the uh, US delegation to that. But Evan Bloom, I just want to shout out, he was one of the co-chairs of that. And he's in this room. But that was remarkable to get a binding uh, uh, agreement on the ability to com make common metadata standards, to have access to, to locations, to be able to share equipment across the Arctic. Um, so those are great examples. Another great example is the uh, UNCLOS. UNCLOS is a standard, set of standards that make geological sense. And as geologists, I'm delighted we can actually do diplomacy where we can identify where the land boundaries are based on the geology of, of the system. And to do that work, the partnerships have been remarkable. We talk about, because the Arctic nations are very competitive in the sense of who's entitled to what in the, in the offshore. However, they work together rather seamlessly uh, to, to find the science necessary for the claims. Uh, US and, um, and Canada with the Healy and St. Laurent going out shooting seismic data. The Canadians working with the, Dan the Danish government and the government of Greenland to define those, those sea margins. So here we have science going in there being used very effectively to build a common base to, for, for countries to make competitive claims. So science diplomacy has worked, uh, worked and worked well in some cases. We also have great examples on observation systems with SEON and with IASC's role in that and GEO globally where we have 115 nations sharing open and often free data on remote sensing, that's remarkable. And that remote sensing data is critical to our nature. So I wanna say it, it does happen. It is challenged when we have lacked the international partnerships, but we can hope we can get back to a situation where the, the data sharing is complete and consistent across the Arctic. Thank you, Mark. Victoria. Hi, good afternoon. I'm here to share a little bit about uh, science diplomacy in relation to indigenous peoples organizations. For context, I'm here to represent the Inuit Circumpolar Council, and in part, our work at the international level is to ensure that research that is done in our homelands is relevant to our own communities and to the 180,000 Inuit that our organization represents. We are involved in a lot of research projects. Um, we are certainly engaged in also bringing indigenous knowledge into the working groups of the Arctic Council within different conventions and treaty bodies. And we've long been engaged in ensuring that not only is there a co-production of knowledge, which is what we have been pushing for for quite some time, but of course also that we are using indigenous knowledge uh, outside of also a co-production of knowledge. And our organization has been very engaged in many of the international fora in which we make this happen, in the United Nations, the Arctic Council, and others. And we look forward to uh, ensuring that indigenous knowledge has a role in science diplomacy and not just within um, a particular subset of work. Thank you, Victoria. Melody? Uh, thank you, and I get to build on both of those wonderful comments uh, by saying what I am really excited to see is the evolution of science diplomacy, and I think the Arctic is the leader in that. It's a model, it's a framework. We have more to do, but uh, it's well ahead of the rest of the world in understanding um, how to work across nations, across peoples, with communities, and especially with thinking of how we uh, share knowledge, share power with indigenous peoples um, in, from the traditional uh, Western way of doing things. Um, so for science diplomacy, I think this is a, an opportunity in a time of challenge. We can also look to what haven't we done yet. What can, we, what can we repair as we move forward? What can we make better as we move forward so we move forward better? And I often say, for the glo global challenge face, challenges facing us, uh, we need, if we want inclusive, ethical, and equitable solutions to those global challenges, be in the Arctic or around the world, we need to figure out, <laughs> get those solutions informed by knowledge that is inclusive, ethical, and equitable. If we have not done that, you can't get B from A. You can't get inclusive, ethical, equitable solutions without those knowledge systems, those diverse knowledge systems, and the ethical and equitable approach. So I think we have a wonderful opportunity to think of a much more inclusive Arctic science diplomacy that follows the Arctic Council's lead of shared power, of shared knowledge, of shared diplomacy. And think about how science diplomacy is no longer just science. It is, the, the framing is really about 
uh, multiple ways of knowing, how do diverse knowledge systems, how are they shared in an ethical and equitable way? And our diplomacy, how does that follow the Arctic Council's example of everyone at the table with a full voice and consensus to have a much more inclusive, ethical, and equitable diplomacy? If we can put those two together, um, we actually can make agreements and move forward to more, more peaceful Arctic with the tools that structurally have changed. And that means our institutions change. We rethink a little bit about how we approach both science and diplomacy. But I see that as a path forward that is showing the Arctic in the lead, showing the uh, knowledge systems of the Arctic in the lead, showing the governance structures that we worked so hard for in the lead for the world. Thank you. You up, Henry. Thank you. Uh, hard to follow that because uh, I agree with everything that you that you said. Um, I'll speak in my, in my role as the president of the International Arctic Science Committee, IASC. Uh, and IASC was established in 1990. We are an independent 24-member uh, organization. All Arctic states are members of IASC and, and many others as well that are conducting Arctic science uh, across the world. Uh, we were part of uh, the process of um, uh, creating new international connections uh, and new forms of science diplomacy uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, and there is a, a clear feeling that uh, Arctic scientists have worked incredibly hard for diplomacy in the Arctic. Uh, and if we are going to continue to be able to do that, then we're going to need diplomats, diplomacy, to begin to return the favor to scientists so that they can open the way for science in the way that scientists helped open the way for diplomacy uh, in the early 1990s and beyond. And there is a surprising amount of optimism that that is the case, that that will be possible. Uh, the announcement that Norway was able to make during their chairship uh, of the Arctic Council uh, is incredibly welcome and is a really positive step forward. Um, but if we're going to take that further, if we're going to make a success of the fifth international polar year, which will be in 2032-33, uh, and we have a range of uh, an initial concept note uh, essentially about that, if we're going to make that a real success, if we're going to make it as impactful and as, uh, as special as it can be, if it's going to build on the success that Mark and others were talking about, uh, we will need all of those with, a, with an interest in making, a, making it a success to be able to, to, be able to do that. Um, the international polar year process is just starting and it is absolutely a polar process. It is Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, it is as inclusive as we want it to be. It will only be a true success if it reflects all the voices, all the states, all the experiences, all the knowledge systems uh, across the Arctic. And that's what we want. And that's what, within IASC, we'll be working with you and many others to do. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. And Rachel. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to be taking us a little bit uh, further into the water. So I'm from a research institute in Norway called Center of Ocean and ocean issues um, are for me really important and I've noticed more and more that they've been really important here during this assembly as well. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, we sometimes tend to forget is that a really large chunk of the Arctic does not belong only to the Arctic states but it belongs to all of humanity and that's the central Arctic Ocean. So one of the big uh, achievements that I've seen, at least in science diplomacy, and that I've experienced myself, culminated in, in June this year uh, when we signed the BB&J agreement. Now that's the big international treaty on protection and use of biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and that, uh, that treaty and, and that adoption of that treaty, bringing that ship to the shore, as the president would say, uh, that whole treaty negotiation process from its initial conception almost 20 years ago when they first started talking about it until the summer when they adopted it by consensus, it was so well informed by science. It was pushed forward by science. I followed all the negotiations. I went to all the meetings at the UN. We were there as scientists. NGOs were there. They were really good at giving time to them, at least in the beginning. Uh, before the real negotiations started. There were breakout sessions. Science was informing at all time, and this is really important in an area such as the Central Arctic Ocean where there are no set owners, so to speak, where the whole world owns it. 
where landlocked countries in Asia are part of the owners and where we need to protect and also sustainably use it. And this is also an arena where traditional indigenous knowledge was consistently brought forward as a very important that needed to be part of the treaty that had to be incorporated. It was also part of the discussion whether or not that knowledge was relevant in an area so far beyond national jurisdiction, which is something that brought out a lot of discussions. Some delegations did not consider it important, but in the end, it did make it into the treaty, which really shows that we've come a long way, both in terms of acknowledging the ocean as a really important arena, whether it's in the Arctic or elsewhere, but also acknowledging different kinds of knowledge systems. And as a political scientist, I'm also very happy to see social science being included in science, which is also very important to bring forward that we have data, social science data is also data, traditional knowledge also brings forward data, whether or not you think of it in the traditional Western sense or more broadly. So for me at least, that has been a really good way forward within science diplomacy, seeing that we get more different knowledge systems coming together in an interdisciplinary manner as well. Thank you, Rachel. I would, like, I would like to now take a few minutes to give our panelists the opportunity to have dialogue with each other. Are there any questions that you have for your fellow, fellow panelists about their points of discussion today? Well, I would love to actually challenge you, Victoria. Uh, coming from that camp, how would traditional indigenous knowledge be able to be translated into an area such as those that are beyond national jurisdiction and at a global arena? How can that be incorporated in global frameworks? Yeah, thanks for that. I think as we all know, biodiversity knows no boundaries. And many of the species that are sharing areas beyond national jurisdiction, especially in the Arctic, are species that are also sharing areas along the coastlines that our peoples also are indivisibly um, connected to for livelihoods, for hunting, fishing, harvesting, more traditional activities. But the knowledge that is known uh, from our people about those particular species, those particular waters, those particular ecosystem dynamics are of course relevant for areas that are beyond national jurisdiction. What I would point out also is, especially for Inuit, which our traditional territories include significant marine areas, ice areas, there are areas within our traditional homelands that are technically bio, uh, beyond national jurisdiction. There's a little bit of space, some slivers there between Canada and Greenland. Um, and of course, uh, north of Greenland in the Central Arctic Ocean. Uh, I wish that I could share some maps and things like this, but actually we often think of the Arctic as being a very sparsely populated area, which is true. But at the same time, there's been a lot of work to show that Inuit are actually very intimately connected to a lot of the uh, landscapes and seascapes within our territories. And in fact, we have trails that go all the way north of Ellesmere Island um, that do, of course, have uh, some relation to the Central Arctic Ocean. So we have knowledge about these spaces for sure, and, and I think part of the reason that it had been pushed so much in the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement is because Inuit specifically would like to be able to inform some of those discussions. And, and then we did see, of course, language on indigenous knowledge actually come through in the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement Joint Program for Scientific Research and Monitoring. There's language there that requires that indigenous knowledge is a part of that program. And we're also seeing other conventions and treaties, including language on using indigenous knowledge for similar reasons, such as the CBD Article 8J. Um, this is a significant discussion that talks about why indigenous knowledge needs to be a part of the implementation of the global biodiversity framework. And it's for very similar reasons as that as well. So of course, our knowledge can't inform everything. We can't inform necessarily uh, genetics and these kinds of things. Um, but we certainly have knowledge to share in, in a time like this where we really need to be on top of climate change, on top of biodiversity loss. It's, it's definitely a tool that we should be using as we come together and, and put together those policies and uh, perspectives on how we're going to move forward. Thank you, Victoria. Are there any other questions from our panelists before we open up to audience questions? Okay. okay. Do we have any questions from the audience that they would like to ask our panelists? 
think we've answered everything. <laughs> Hi. This is on. Yeah. I'm Helena Berman. I'm with the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And I'm wondering if you could comment on science communication from scientists to the world as whether you think it works well or not. Melody, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, that's a, a wonderful question. And uh, I think. I always think of science communication um, as needing to be parsed a little more carefully as to, because I, I teach a course actually on the practice of science policy and diplomacy at Dartmouth and I always, my first, uh, my first rule is it's the science has to be excellent. That's rule number one. Rule number two is it's not about the science. Um, and so the science communication is really about understanding your audience. What they, what, it's not what you want to necessarily always tell them, it's what they might be interested in hearing. So it's learning more about the communities with whom you're speaking, learning their issues. So science communication is a skill, um, and maybe in certain scientific audiences or certain schools, there's one way you talk, but maybe with the public, you might learn more about the community and what they've been going through before you try your science communication spending time with communities, uh, spending time with your audience. Oh, science policy is a form of science communication, but you have to understand the policy-making sphere and what policymakers care about. So it's, it's a little, so science communication is never a one-way street. It's a two-way street, it's a three-way street. It's really trying to bring all those ideas together, and that makes very effective science communication. But it does have to start with science, scientists recognizing their, they need to maybe think a little bit more outside of their normal jargon, their normal ideas, and take some time to understand their audience and their needs. Could I add a bit to that? Yes, please, Mark. Um, science communication is extremely difficult because the science, as we know, for the, for the large problems in the Arctic, like, like climate change, is very complex and very integrated and very interdisciplinary. And it has a huge amount of uncertainty in various elements of it. And policymakers don't like uncertainty. They want an answer. And the scientist is really, in my opinion, obligated to, to tell them what the data tells them and what the limitations of those data sets are. And, and, and really, the conclusions have to be objective. Once the scientist goes into the advocacy mode, then they're, they're really lost the power of the science. So you have to be very conscious. You have to be very aware of the questions, as, as was pointed out, that are being asked and the relevancy of the science to the question. But you have to be able to explain really complex issues relatively simply, and at the same time, um, relevantly. And that is an art and very difficult to do often. Thank you, Mark. I, I would actually disagree. I, I don't think it is difficult, but I think it's difficult for the scientists to want to do that. Because as you point out, we're scared of each other, like are we saying something that we are going to be arrested of by fellow scientists? Uh, are, we, are we willing to stand in front of a camera and say what we have researched? Are we willing to say it in a manner that we can get everyone to understand it? In, are we willing to, in a sense, put ourselves out there? And in very many cases, we're not <laughs> willing to put ourselves out there. And I think until we do, until many scientists do, and are willing to go out and effectively communicate, take a course, learn how to get things out, we are going to be sort of sitting over there pretending to still be in our ivory tower, but we're going to have to get down there to actually communicate what it is we learned. We know so much, and we're holding on to it. And I, I do think, I think it's a great question, and I really do hope and wish that more people in science and in academia would be able and want to put themselves out there and, and take that risk or being arrested on something and have that discussion uh, and, and really move forward with the information that we are sitting on. Is there another question? Hi, Anna Rose MacArthur from Coeric. I heard something earlier that I interpreted uh, um, that science diplomacy creates certain pathways that allow public policy diplomacy to move forward and um, now it's time for public policymakers to um, create some pathways for science diplomacy to move forward, if I heard that correctly. And I'm wondering 
what are the mechanisms you'd like to see public policymakers do that for scientists? And um, the context that I think of first is where I live in Alaska and the Northern Bering Sea is very close to Russia and very much a shared ecosystem, that very narrow Northern Bering Sea and how to allow that scientific diplomacy to continue between our two countries during our current political moment. Henry? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, you say these things on the stage and then people ask you hard but, but fair questions about them. Um, it, I think it's partly a response to the fact that um, we all recognize that Russia is half of the Arctic. There is no one who would say you can properly understand the Arctic without understanding Arctic Russia. Uh, we would all want those systems to be re-established, those connections to be re-established as soon as they can be. That doesn't mean they should be done immediately, but as soon as they, as soon as they possibly can be. Uh, and everyone will also say that where possible, preserving uh, researcher to researcher links, uh, preserving particularly links with early career researchers and others is really, really important. And I've not heard anyone say that that's not true. But the reality is that we can't expect the research community to do that by themselves. They need some, some support, some encouragement, uh, some clear-eyed but straightforward uh, kind of support and guidance from the people who, whose job it is, essentially, is to, is to make diplomacy work. Um, and I wouldn't point to particular areas, that's not my responsibility, but if we really mean that we do want to come back to a better position, it won't be the same, but at some point it may settle into something that we can live with and that we can achieve more with, then we're going to need some of those contacts to be made at appropriate levels in appropriate ways. And I think the, the, the way that the Arctic Council has been re-established is a fantastic start to that, and there are other, other ways of doing it as well. We have a uh, an international conference on Arctic research planning, the fourth one of those, and that's looking about the next 10 years of Arctic uh, priorities. And we want that process to be as inclusive as, as possible and to reflect all the voices of the, of the Arctic. Uh, so I think, I don't have a specific solution for you, but from the International Arctic Science Committee side, I think we want those connections to continue to be made. Thank you, Henry. Anyone else want to comment on that before we take the next question? We have one here in the front. Thank you, Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. I wanna follow on the issue of communication because yesterday I was asked uh, on this stage uh, about science that is being uh, criticized or critiqued through a political lens, that it is being viewed as, as more of a partisan issue, uh, it's Republican, it's Democrat, and it, it is a challenge. And as science, I'm not a scientist, I was asked that as the, as the politician, but from the scientist's perspective, is, is this an accurate observation that science now is being more viewed as politically driven? And if so, how, how do you all address this? How can we help make sure that that science is validated for, for what it is and not a political means to an end? Hmm. Thank you. Right. Please, um, great question, Senator Murkowski. And as you know, it's been politicized for a long time. It's just now it's more extreme. And I put it in the camps of what lawyers are trained to do, pull out the pieces of information that best support your case rather than look at the system and, and look at the data objectively. So the scientist has to really um, politely and respectfully say you're mis misusing it, the data doesn't say that, this is what the data says, and this is the limitations of how you can use that data. Um, I've had the privilege of being in many hearings on climate change where I got a lot of dirty looks by saying you can't do that with the data set. But I felt it was the right thing to do. Or, and the facts were cherry picked on both sides of the issue uh, in terms of how extreme our, our mitigation and adaptation strategies should be versus how good the data sets are. 
And the scientist just has to stay the course and say, this is what our data tells you, this is what it, what it doesn't tell you. And then tell the policymakers and ultimately the funders where, how you can fill those gaps. Uh, the other part is the quality control process in science is really important. The peer review process is the, is the gold standard. So it takes time to peer review. It's not perfect, but it does provide external input into the quality of the science and challenges those scientific assumptions pretty effectively. So peer review science, quality controlled data sets, commonized metadata, attention to detail is really expensive. That's the other problem, but it's necessary. And so when that data goes through the gold standard tests, it has more value uh, and should be treated that way. Um, and the scientist, again, has to really remove themselves from their, their own biases in presenting it. And sometimes it happens, most of the time that is the way scientists treat it, but sometimes they don't. So the other part is the communications with the press becomes a problem because the press is, not, is looking for a sound bite. They aren't looking at the results of the science. They're looking, what can I pull out of this to make my story stronger? As, and so we're seeing that done more and more, those biases. I do think the problem, one of the problems of the internet, the artificial intelligence in the internet is it's able to select the information it feeds you for the information bias, including pulling out those sections of the, of the data set. So it's a really difficult problem. There's a huge amount of information bias in general, but specifically with quality science, you can push back on that. But it's very difficult to do that when the moment's passed. So we're in an era where science needs to demonstrate its quality, its integrity, and the scientists themselves need to build a relationship of trust with whoever they're talking to. Uh, so these, these are difficult processes. They're workable. I am concerned about the information bias on the internet, though, and the way that's picked up and used. I, I don't have an answer for that. Thank you, Mark. Henry, did you want to say a quick few words to that? I was just going to add just very briefly that I think scientists have got a lot better at, at presenting and understanding risk. Uh, and some of the language that's used around the IPCC and other documents where people talk about an outcome being highly likely or uh, medium confidence or high confidence, I think that's the kind of language that people will understand in their daily lives. And I'm not saying that should be adopted broadly, but you can see the rationale for that. And some of that use of, of common terminology to describe complicated things can, can work, I think. And I would like to add a, a response to that, taking the privilege of the chair, is that I do have anecdotal stories about other researchers who have been part of reports that have made their way in front of uh, government ministers, but because those ministers may not may feel that the science comes from a different persuasion than their party line. They have chosen to not use that. There was a researcher who, a few years ago, who was talking on social media saying, Donald Trump is deleting my citations. So we have science disappearing as well. So there is some of this happening, and it is a challenge that we have to deal with as scientists. So unfortunately, the uh, the We've been told that our time has elapsed, and I know there are many more questions and people who wanted to ask more questions. So please come and talk to the panelists after the session. And thank you, everyone, for being here today.